So this is John Costa from the Documentary Media Centre. So it's day five of the 16 days of activism. And today we're going to talk a little bit with a good friend of mine, Paul, Paul Riley, Dr. Paul Riley from the University of Glasgow about conflict memory. So, Paul, how are you this morning? I'm good. Thanks, John. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. So, listen, this be, uh, the reason I wanted to catch up with you um, today is obviously it's, you know, the 29th of November, so it's the, I need to get this right, it's the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people, which seems to have taken on a very different kind of uh, feel this year due to the, the, the ongoing situation um, in Gaza. Uh, and previously, it's always been about, for me, trying to get people to follow or read or watch, you know, again, a, a whole range of documentaries or podcasts or photo essays um, or sort of online interactive projects that people are doing in those areas about those subjects. And so therefore they've got some, some lived experience. And I know that the recent conference that you organized up there in the University of Glasgow, which I was lucky enough to come along to had elements about Gaza and Palestine in it as well but a whole range of a whole range of different kind of conflicts you know from small through to war through to genocide and stuff like that what tell me a little bit about where the idea for the the conference came from and, and why you decided to organize it. it was called media and conflict memory wasn't it yes I mean I, I think part of the credit probably goes down to our collaboration with the DMC that uh, obviously conflict memory and education is something that I've been involved in with the DMC for a couple of years now and obviously have done a few things with you in the past online. So there's an element of that. I think my kind of starting point was probably that, the collection of of books and artifacts and documentaries that you have. Thinking more broadly about you know, my own research is very much to date being on social media, but that's not the the all that you can talk about that. But my study on Instagram that you and I have talked about a few years ago in terms of uh, memory and how people remember the the troubles uh, back where I'm from um, was certainly a, a way into this as a subject area. And I think with the, with the work of group I'm involved in at uh, the International Association of Media Communication Researchers, uh, we have talked, I mean, our conference always gets a lot of papers on this. So the idea was really building on that, but to be more specifically focused on all types of media, how they're used to remember and to forget conflicts and looking for diversity in terms of the type of conflicts was an important strategy we had in terms of how we advertised it. We were very clear we wanted people who looked at documentary, looked at newspaper coverage, looked at social media, looked at video, looked at how conflict is, is remembered, also how people share their testimony what they remember of it, um, and also how that's used by people who have no living memory of that conflict. I think that was a recurring theme last week when we, when we had the event, that this was often people who did not directly experience this, but had it almost either passed down through family, through what they'd been told, or they were experiencing it through media. And I think that's where the media and conflict memory theme came from. Yeah, I mean, it's a, fasc it's a fascinating subject area because, you know, for me, it's very much, you know, having been in the army, but then talking to people now. So, you know, we've got our Ukrainian documentary mm. just made, made by a Chechen journalist, Aslan Beck. So, you know, it's that, there's that conflict memory from people's experiences, not just mm -hmm. war fighting, but actually being, um, you know, a, a non-combatant, you know, a, a, mm -hmm. a civilian, you know, women, children. Um, and I guess a, a lot of the conflict memory that will come out of the current Gaza conflict will be focused around that as well. Mm -hmm. But then to hear people talking particularly sort of early career academics in a way where obviously there's academic language but they're talking about you know youtube and how it's used to mm -hmm. present and frame these particular you know almost like cinematic films that were made about the greek civil war with mm -hmm. no context to them almost like you know panoramas almost like lawrence of arabia style things through to you know, the memory of um, communism in Romania. I thought that was a fascinating talk as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then right through to, you know, photos from Bloody Sunday. But then yes, yeah. a lot of the conversations that we were talking about um, with the uh, researcher from Ukraine about the use of Telegram by Russians and Ukrainians and sort of, you know, mon monuments in particular and taking them down and defacing them and reporting them and finding them reminded mm -hmm. very much straight back to a connection with your own Instagram um, project about how photos are used to, to frame the troubles. I mean, mm. how, do, how do you go about selecting 
those people. I'm sure there's an element of genius there to be able to get into flow <laughs> like that. But uh, how many submissions yes. did you get overall to, to get down to the ones that we had over those two days? We had nearly 70 submissions. And obviously we had a very limited, uh, well, we could only accept a certain number of people. So you're right. I mean, there was there had to be a degree of selectivity in terms of this. I mean, I, I think what we tried to do in terms of you know the review process, because we had so many, was to look at obviously what they were studying. Was it relevant to the thing? Because we, we did have some submissions that perhaps weren't as close a match as the ones you've just referred to. Mm -hmm. So it was a difficult process. I, I mean, I think certainly... Um, my experience of of uh, working within the IMC working group, which looks at crisis and security and conflict and, and communication around it, you tend to get um, whatever historical events happened recently, things follow. So, for example, COVID-19 for several years was dominant. R the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I think, as you'd expect, has been prominent. And again, that was reflected in the papers that we had last week, that online and in person, that like Anastasia, who was in person, but also had other papers online who dealt with that. So there is an element where you, you don't want it to be a conference about Russian invasion of Ukraine. It's a broader thing than that. Um, I was really, really pleased. And I think I said this um, in communication with the participants. We had people presenting from every continent, effectively. Um, uh, we were presenting work on every continent. There was a, a real diversity, things that... I'm sure you like I, John. I, I didn't know much about Burfin's work, for example, and Dursum, the Dursum massacre. I mean, that to me was entirely new. And when you look at work like that, I think it, it's almost a responsibility to try and give it a platform because mm -hmm. it's something that, I mean, I, I think from my experience, you know, research in Northern Ireland is a niche area in media and communication studies now. It's not something which is common. So it was very nice for me to be on a panel with other people doing that. That's the first time ever for me you know 20 odd years as a, as a researcher where i was able to have a conversation with people who were doing things about a context that i was researching so i quite like that aspect that we were very diverse in terms of participant in terms of what they were studying in terms of the methods they were using and as you say we had a, a real spectrum of approaches which i thought made for a really rich discussion and amongst the workshop yeah, I'm just picking up on that, you know, every continent. I thought that was quite interesting as well. You know, we had something about Colombia um, that was particularly mm -hmm. interesting about, um, you know, the different areas and mm -hmm. urban areas and the connectivity with like media coverage and newspapers and, and things through to something like the Dersim ma massacre in, in, in Turkey of the Kurds, you know, where there's that almost like the Armenian genocide has probably mm -hmm. been the one that you know particularly with the eu has been recognized and always causes that issue mm -hmm. with turkey about um you know recognizing that genocide and i guess i've seen it play out as well in the since since i saw you last thursday mm -hmm. when you dropped me off at the train station in glasgow last thursday is that conversations now about people calling what's gone on in gaza genocide and people are like, oh it's not genocide blah, blah, blah. What, at what point do you get to you know is it a number is it a kind of, you know, a declaration by mm -hmm. three yeah. intelligent people sitting in a line saying it's a genocide? At what point is genocidal behaviour able to be called out as as genocide? And I, I guess there'll be a lot of the post um, conflict at the moment. A lot of that discussion will be about, you know, two states, where are they going to be hires? You know, what's going to happen to Gaza? Mm -hmm. All those all of those kind of things, quite rightly. But I think also broadly more about the impact of international law. And it's almost like ineffectiveness, mm -hmm. which we've relied on our generation for the last 70, 80 years since Nuremberg to be the thing that will sort things out. And we're happy to have little blips, you know, Kosovo and things like that. But yeah. this seems to have been right in the face of international law. And, you know, I'll, I'll stop when I'm ready and then I'll come back to the rules, if you like. Mm. It's strange. I mean, and, and we had that pretty much reflected in, in, in that body of people, didn't we? I think it's interesting you talk about that. I mean, we, there's often cliches about history being written by the winners. You know, the winners define that. I think in many of the presentations we had, there was a relevance of that. I mean, it, it was interesting to think about also how the meaning of images or videos, you know, I mean, it can't change wholly, but it can be interpreted differently. And I, I think that was something that I think resonates and does, I mean, having an event, um, in, in the midst of what's happening in Gaza, obviously it, it is quite a stark uh, feeling. I mean, I think one of our online presenters 
did some work on on Gaza and on on digital activism in that context, which seemed very timely. Again, this was this was submitted to us in the summer before what's happened. So, I think it's a, a reminder that memory is contested. I mean, again, I I think Sandra made a very good point about this. You know, thinking about um, how you interpret um, photographs of Bloody Sunday. You know that um, those photographs were used um, to exonerate the soldiers in Derry. And, uh, during Bloody Sunday, but they're also used as part of the, the the counter narrative to say, well, this shouldn't have happened. And I think there's an element my word because it's online and it's immediate. We're more exposed to it. I mean, I, I think I've been struck by with uh, particularly on social media. We have we have experts already saying this is a genocide. We have experts on genocide who say this is a genocide. Mm -hmm. Of course, the Israeli counter narrative, which is also available and broadcast and amplified, will deny that it's happening in real time. And, and I think very often, I think what academic work misses is there's a lag between when academic work is published and what's happening now. So it's, it's something that follows it. So it's this recurrent theme, I think, that we had last week, which was the contestation, to use an academic word, or you could just say debate, argument, you know, disagreement, whatever word you want to use. These things are never fully settled, mm. even if even if there is a, a consensus view on an atrocity or on events, there still will often be in the you know the the dark reaches of the internet somebody who disagrees with it, even if the majority of people don't. And I think media often play a key role <clears throat> in in amplifying things like that and in making things more visible or less visible, depending on how you engage with it. And I think that was something I sort of took very strongly from the events that. In most presentations, I would say nearly all, there was a discussion about how media is, it's not a case, this is a permanent monument or memorial to, to, to refer to Anastasia's work on, on Telegram, for example. This is something which will be continually fought over, just mm -hmm. to be fought over online or via other forms of media. Because it was, yeah, and it's interesting how you say history is written by the winners, you know, or shape, you know, history can be shaped by the winner. I guess also conflict memory is very much like that as well isn't it unless you go mm -hmm. out to consciously mm -hmm. capture the impact on particularly non-combatants um mm -hmm. because most of the people that are combatants are already fighting for a particular cause or ideology or you know can be controlled because they're part of something whereas the impact on your average person mm -hmm. they're more likely to have the accurate reflection on you know what the impact was of you know the russians coming into a butcher for example you know all, all mm -hmm. of those kind of things that we've we've seen um and, and as those people die out um mm -hmm. as with the dursim uh, genocide you know there are no no real living descendants now it's about you know second third generation there were 60 photographs that she could find you know <clears throat> how are we going to look at those and frame those and everybody kind of pitched in it seemed very collegiate in its nature that everyone was out to try and give some advice rather than critique which mm. academia can seem very much about it's about looking at the reading list and then adding to, to it and critiquing mm -hmm, yeah. so and so whereas in fact there was a lot of support there for people about well actually have you tried this method or have you read this book they've done some work on that that might inform your mm -hmm. research or practice here actually i think as an outsider sitting in an academic situation i was like oh i was expecting it to be a little bit more fisticuffs than it was because everybody just seemed to be there for the subject and how important mm. the theme of the of the conference was oh yeah very much <laughs> i think uh i think that that's what i, I mean academic work should be by definition collaborative but i think you're right to say that often it's adversarial and often it's, it's there's a seniority built into it so um i think what was very refreshing about last week was that uh whatever people's experience background where they worked what they worked on you know experience of methods that were being used or not there was a curiosity about it which i think is vitally important i think you're right to say you know we think about go back to many of the presentations there about how citizens you know document these things and, and pass them on uh, and there were many cases of that i mean often photographic images were, were raised but other forms of media too uh, there's also responsibility on, on researchers too you know i think you know you can there may be a variety of motivations as to why people study certainly last week there was evidence of this very often it is a curiosity to 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 reveal things that haven't been talked about or to to actually 
give voice to those whose memory is captured, whether it's photograph or video or other forms of media as well. Because as you say, very often these things can, well, I think they don't get lost as often. I think I clarify that by saying, if you think about what we have now online, we have so much content that it's it's very often hard to to lose content as easily, perhaps as it was when it was just in an archive, when an archive could physically be destroyed. We have a lot more stuff out there. There's a lot more stuff we can get at, but also I think we have to make some sort of sense of it. I mean, I, by sense, I don't mean there being one narrative on it. There are clearly spaces we saw last week for more than one, but we also have to give voice to that. And I, and I think researchers um, certainly last week showed that, that that was a key motivation, very often a personal one, because people had a personal connection. Like Anastasia, for example, thinking of Ukraine, you know, they had personal experience of this. So that was a reason why they felt they wanted to research it, even though it was, uh, she talked very powerfully about uh, research in Telegram. That's something she couldn't switch off because she was living it. Mm. You know, I, I that that sort of struck me several times that people were talking about how they were in proximity. They had been to the places they were studying. They had known the people that were captured on photograph or on video. You know, many of these people were friends. So, they felt it was not just an academic duty, it was a moral one. Yeah. Is this what you were saying? I mean, I've got my notes up here from your talk. Mm -hmm. um, and you did all right, actually. It's all right. I've got seven. Oh, you're very kind, John. Lighting <laughs> <laughs> like the ten. mood for one moment there. Like, yeah. you know. um, and I've written down a few things you said here about, um, you know, a few shared narratives on the past, you know, a, a barrier to reconciliation and sort of collective versus collected memory so you know towards memory mm. of the multitude mm -hmm. and things like you know war by other means and it's interesting that you know winners or losers are both able to to shape a particular narrative about their mm. experience now which is very different i guess in 2023 with things like social media and digital media and ability to be able mm. to like you said not just put something in an archive that can be destroyed but actually have it there available for people that are in similar situations um, mm -hmm. It almost makes you wonder, you know, how large conflicts like World War Two. I mean, I know in World War, the World War One commemoration in in the UK, 2014 to 2018, they, they were tweeting major incidents of World War One every day on Twitter, as it was mm -hmm. then, um, you know, to, to do that over five years of, you know, um, you know, 20, if it's 2025 to to, you know, to 20. 31 i mean in these six years the war went on didn't it for, for a lot of people by the time they came home and got out and stuff and started to repair the situation just how bleak it was for those first couple of years almost like a mm -hmm. complete and total lack of good news at all and mm -hmm. how things had to be manufactured like commandos and stuff to start giving some news about we were striking back um notice how i used the word we there it's interesting isn't it so sort of kicks into mm -hmm. your own narrative but i think for me it's very much around how then someone who's been on the receiving end of uh, a colonial conflict. I'm thinking about the Mau Mau in particular with the King recently going to, to Kenya. Um, you know, the ability for people now to shape that particular group of people's struggle in a way where it's for the first time them telling their story rather than them mm -hmm. being subject of a story in, in a carefully controlled mainstream press uh, that we're, we're only really scratching the surface of the ability of digital media and social media platforms to give a voice to those that have been on the receiving end of maybe colonialist, imperialist um, kind of w wars and conflicts and, you know, um, mm. occupations, I guess, in the past. I suppose, that, I mean, the the cautionary note, yes, I, I think you're right. Voice is important. And uh, and again, people people feeling they have a, an opportunity to, to share is important too. And I think... Um, despite all the negatives, social media is still a valuable tool for that, as you just mentioned. On on this day, history accounts, something I've not studied at great length, but certainly that I would follow with an interest on Instagram, for example. You know, um, They are a, a source of information for people. I mean, I think the, the, the caveat to that is probably who are you speaking to? I mean, I think with museums, you know, because they're physical structures and you've got a lot of experience in this, people choose to go there they have a motivation to do it it's online to a certain extent you can use hashtags you can promote certain things a certain way but you may well get an audience you don't intend and it may not always be a favorable audience so i think there's an element where i think go back to my presentation when you had examples of negative comments about abuse in the instagram 
you know, comments thread of some pictures of British soldiers, for example. Um, some of them, you know, you're looking at this in terms of you don't know the motivation of the person. It's what they've left as a as a trace, if you like. Um, it sometimes can generate negatives. And I think there is that element where we almost have to weigh up the positives in terms of voice, in terms of representation, in terms of being able to share images that haven't been widely seen of the Dursan massacre, for example, uh, in Turkey. Or, and also with the fact that it may mean that the people who are sharing it get abuse for what they believe. And it may be people do these things for a variety of reasons. So I think overall digital technology is good for conflict memory. I think it opens it up. It means that people don't have to physically go to a museum in London to see something. They can they can do it online. That's that's certainly for accessibility a really big win. But there is a potential cost to that, which is that who are they speaking to? If the aim is to to promote a narrative which is not widely known, I suppose the question is how do you judge that to be a success or not? Mm-hmm. And it kind of comes back to that idea now. It's almost that memory of the multitude that my colleague Andrew Hoskins um, has written about extensively. People sharing these things doesn't change minds necessarily. It may to some people, but for the most of it's about a conflict which is still seen as 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 in process or recently finished. People will interpret that with what they remember of that event. So even if the picture shows something that they probably would not support or would not agree with, they're not likely to change their mind about that anyhow. So there's an element where we have to probably be worried that the media is not going to necessarily change hearts and minds in the way that the person sharing it wants. But then they may also just want other people to who have a similar experience to share that. So it can be very much about building within communities, within groups who experience things rather than reaching out to people who have a different view. Yeah, I mean, I want to move on to um, Valentina's presentation about Romania. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think one of the things that she said to me, we were walking down to the meal on the, on the Wednesday evening, and she was saying about that, you know, the younger generation in Romania is very much EU. You know, they're part of the EU, mm-hmm. yeah. it, Europe's their connection, communism, something in the past. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and because we don't kind of sit down for family meals now in the old days like everybody used to, <clears throat> there's no real interconnect, uh, inter- interconnection between generations, no intergenerational mm-hmm. conversations about that time um, with the Russians and stuff like that. And it was fascinating in her presentation as well. And I've never seen this before or heard anything about it, about how people were framing the Russian occupation experience with the Germans, where mm-hmm. the Germans were like very friendly and they would ask and they did this and stuff like that. And it's it was absolutely fascinating. And I never really mm-hmm. considered that. And, I, and it really made me realise that I knew... Um, I consider the fact I know a lot running the, the, the conflict reportage archive, mm-hmm. but also the fact just probably how much a uh, little I knew about occupation uh, or, you know, the, the the time from World War Two to the collapse of the Berlin Wall of the impact of people of living in a in a uh, an occupied area like under the communism and the communist bloc. I mean, I, I had it obviously from one of my eldest student I ever taught Gerhardt he was in his 70s when he came on communication arts you know and he said he Mm. can still remember being a teenager very clearly you know people talking about the war it was still quite fresh he can remember sort of the by the Meinhof coming along and it was angry youth fighting back about trying to find their place in the world Mm. we don't really know much about the whole kind of communist cold war element of you know what we what we frame as the cold war yeah I mean I think it kind of comes back to how social media can focus on things which are not well seen or not well visible. Um, I mean, I think during Valentina's presentation, I mean, one of the, I think I, I spoke to her about it after the event that, you know, we see some reporting of people, that, for example, in East Germany who yearn for East Germany, you know, again, for anyone living outside East Germany or particularly in Western Europe, you'd, you'd assume that reunification, the end of the wall, uh, again, the end of the Cold War was was viewed automatically as a positive. Um, I think in most conflicts, you probably see a degree of nostalgia for a period where things were perceived as being more more, more moral, as you just said, sitting around the table eating dinner. You know, things were seen as perhaps running away, which was was uh, better, for want of a better word, than perhaps how they are now. Um, you can harp back to lots of conflicts. I think that came through with some of the presentations too. That. Um, People who don't who didn't live through something, 
uh, will get a distorted view of it depending on what source they go to for information on it. And, and I think there's an element of that where media kind of recirculates these ideas, you know, about things like this. Uh, but my own experience, you know, we, we mentioned about lived experience. I mean, you know, for the first, what, 20 years of my life, there was the troubles. Um, I remember it very well in the news coverage. I remember um, on a almost daily basis, there being a report of a bomb attack or someone being killed. Um, there are people who are born post 98 who seem to think that that period was better because of, again, a morality judgment, an idea that the peace process has not given them what they want. So there's almost this, as you go back to post-conflict, this idea, well, if, if people feel they have been disadvantaged by post-conflict, they almost think, well, conflict was better. Mm -hmm. I'd argue that strongly that's not accurate and that there should be an element where post-conflict transition, whatever the context requires compromise on on many sides, not just one. And that within that, there should always be a key fact that people aren't being killed or killed in the same number as they were before there was peace or a peace agreement or a ceasefire. So we have to be sort of wary of that, that people often have a, perhaps a nostalgia which is not based on lived experience because they weren't there or a nostalgia based on experience which they they remember in a way which perhaps isn't accurate. Hmm. I want to I want to finish as well just talking to you briefly about I read an article this morning um early early this morning and it was saying about the conflict in the Middle East in the broadest sense. Almost so many different regional players mm -hmm. nibbling at the edges of what's going on with this conflict that it's almost 1914 again, which is, you know, there's no, there probably won't be necessarily one great big mass event, if you like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? I'm, and I'm not decrying what's happened so far in this conflict, but to bring everybody else in, but more, you know, he was saying, I'm sitting here now looking down into this valley on this particular border. And he said, like, you know, it only takes, it would take a stray shell from there to take out a bus full of kids here to get a retaliatory response, which then, escalated and you know you're my friend and we're relied and stuff like that before people got dragged into um a much bigger conflagration if you like not just only in the middle east but maybe more across mm -hmm. the region and with ramifications then when you start thinking about you know we're under attack type stuff it just feels real for the first time in a long time from you know personal experience but also you know looking mm -hmm. at history back to world war ii that you could debate whether the Cold War was in fact the Third World War. And if we were all to go to war now, it'd be the Fourth World War, but it's that World War Four, you know. So it's more about it just seems much more now rather than regionally focused, flare points, civil wars, internal conflicts, you know, the troubles, those kind of terminology. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, the the drums of war are beating again. Very kind of like the early days of, you know, Gulf War One and Gulf War Two and Afghanistan 9-11, where mm -hmm. it's almost the language that's being used by people that should be in positions of authority and ultimately the ones that can vote and make decisions rather than us um, seem to be very much determined to to go further than we are at the moment. I mean, from your perspective, you know, what 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 are you viewing? I mean, I said the, conf the, the, the conference last week really gave me two days just to focus on that and think about that. I think it's tricky. I think you're right to say that this is, um, yeah, in my lifetime, that probably the the conflict has the potential to spiral uh, and to, to involve many different actors. I mean, I think I would suggest though that I mean, Rus the Russian invasion of Ukraine is also in context for this, and I think we have to probably look at um, events, things didn't just happen in the last five or six weeks since the start of October. I mean, I think there's a there's a, a longer context to this where we do have you know very frosty diplomatic relations between russia china and you know western powers like the us and obviously the eu and nato so i think we have to probably put this in some kind of context this is not just came out of nowhere i mean i, I think uh it would be remiss of us not to plug kirsty russell's fantastic documentary freedom to run which provides context about what's been happening in the palestinian occupied territories over a longer period that we we just don't hear about as much as we should in countries like the uk uh, and i think for for a lot of people certainly their response to what's happened in gaza over the last six weeks is to say well this is this is not a recent conflict this is a long-term issue that has not been dealt with and there have been people being killed in gaza and the west bank going back with no 
no major outrage and, and no major comment to your response in terms of the UK or the West. I think probably my sort of my sort of concern about this is that it goes back to what you said at the start of this chat that the rules haven't worked. You know, we think about the United Nations, what happened post 1945, um, lots of statements from world leaders that this can never happen again and that the rules system was put in place to sanction states from to stop them from doing this. And I think what we've seen certainly with Israel's actions that um, the UN seem powerless to rein them in. I think it's fair to say the last, you know, the last since October the 7th, I mean, they haven't worked. You have a system whereby um, for a lot of people, a lot of countries will look at this and go, well, what is the consequence if I do engage in behaviours which are effectively genocidal? I mean, I think that's a bigger question in terms of what what do we learn from this? Um, there are obviously at the minute as we speak, you know, we do have these, you know, these temporary ceasefires or pauses or whatever they want to call them. But uh, you do sort of wonder, how do you stop this? Not just spiraling now, but how do you stop future incidents like this happening? Um, I that's a, a very complex yeah. question. And obviously in terms of Israel, yeah. I mean, in terms I of Israel, Palestine, it's not a new one. I mean, I, I was going to say 93, we had Oslo. Um, it's a bit, I mean, there's a, there's a comparison here to the 1998 Belfast Good Friday Agreement. People assume there's agreement done that said it's, it's all solved and it's not. I mean, I think this shows that politicians and those at the top elites, hmm. they can do an awful lot to build peace, but there's a lot more to it than just handshakes and photo ops. You know, they have to actually lead. They have to actually believe in reconciliation. And, and obviously what we've seen, what's happening in Israel uh, and versus Gaza at the minute, that's not happened. I mean, there's a, a lot of research out there in terms of the impact, the cost of occupation that I think the UK, US and some of the countries that seem to have been supportive of Israel seem to have turned a blind eye to. And I think that's worrying because that does go back to your point about does this escalate further or do we have a situation which is even worse, I think, which is that countries know they can do these mm -hmm. things and there's no consequence that suggests something more fundamentally problematic about the UN, about how the system of rules works. Because yeah. yeah, I mean, I raised this with a couple of your colleagues around the table last week about some of the areas of you know tension around the world, like you know Kashmir, and then you've got mm -hmm. sort of you know Western Sahara. You know, if the, the, they decide to come in and sort of wipe out the Polisario in one day, you know, mm -hmm. what 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 would the reaction be? Well, I, I think they probably you know they always thought, well, I'm don't care what the reaction is because ultimately you, you can do you can do nothing about it so you know does that embolden others to seize territories and stuff and of course you've just had the the, the election of the right-wing president in argentina right, yeah. you know does that does that put argent you know does that put the the malvinas the falklands back on the on the table when it comes to you know um, a potential flashpoint because obviously mm. all of these things when people are talking particularly politicians are talking up areas and using popularism to to whip the, the masses through the media that seems to play a very willing game at the moment to be able to put these messages out as an impact on things like budgets and mm -hmm. military spending and and stuff you know and you and i could have a conversation all day about the falklands and you know could we could we do anything like that again would we want to do anything like that again should we do anything like that again if, if this situation happens um but but you're right to say i mean i mean just to Put this in some context. The UK and US are now talking about we need more arms. You know, we need we need to invest more military, mm -hmm. which is never a good sign for obvious reasons because that suggests that they think that they're likely to deploy these things in the future. And and it, and it, I mean, go back to conflict memory. You know, I mean, you know, you and I are not that old to remember World War Two, obviously, just to for the viewers to know that. But I mean, thinking about Optics, yeah, thank you. Well, yeah, in the last <laughs> thirty years, I mean, you know, we had what happened in bosnia we had images you know which were very similar to the concentration camps in the, in the 1940s in world war ii we had rwanda you know we seemed to, to still have i mean we, we talked about you know the dersen massacre and again the memory of that we talk about armenia um these things are happening now you know these things are documented there, there's there is loads of evidence of these things happening yet we're still in a position where we will have some people try to justify them, which again, I think for most people is apparent, but there are people who will justify this on, on other grounds. And we don't seem to have any evidence that people are 
being true to their word when they say never again. That's a phrase that's often used after conflict. People say we should not. Political leaders will stand and have the handshakes and say collectively, we should never allow this to happen. But it does. It's happened repeatedly. And as you say, where's the consequence? Yeah, I think we can say that, you know, the Hague and we have had people, you know, you know, trials for what happens in the former Yugoslavia. But, you know, it's happening again. It's happening now in front of us. It's happening on our phones, on our TVs. And for a lot of people, I think there's a helplessness about that, that they sort of feel that, well, if there isn't a consequence for this, if this can happen, you know, who's going to sort this out? Can it be sorted out? Um, is there something here we need to do differently? I think that's probably a depressing note for us to end on. Well, yeah, I was going to say, what's what's um, what mm -hmm. comes out of a conference like this? Mm -hmm. I mean, what's it? What's the aspiration? What is you'd like to happen next? I mean, there's an amazing group of people that came together for two days. You know, is it a is there a desire to continue that? Is there a desire to do anything with the work that was presented? <clears throat> I hope so. I mean, I, I think there will be publications out of it too, but I think we should. Um, aim to to create some sort of network which looks at this area i mean specifically i think it's as you said it's, it was a very collegiate uh, and collaborative group and, and i think the the generosity and the curiosity throughout the, the two days i thought was um very refreshing not always the case in my experience so i'm hopeful that we will be able to build on this with another event at least and, and with the other outputs that we have planned so a book maybe other things too but i think it's it's keeping conversations going. And I think it comes back to what you've done with the DMC on conflict memory and education, that you need these spaces to share knowledge, but not always to share knowledge with people who know the area that you work in, know what you do. I think very often you get more insightful comments, feedback, discussion with people who study something very different. And I think that was what I really appreciated. I know you did too, that some of the papers um, that were presented, uh, chimed with each other spoke to each other you know they had similarities that perhaps even when i put together the program i wouldn't have seen or for or foreseen and i thought that was really good so i think these sorts of things are important in terms of knowledge in terms of exchange and in terms of drilling into what drives conflict memory what happens with it what the impact is what the benefits are perhaps what the downsides are too brilliant cool thanks very much now i've got your um your book here I'm going to reach down just to prove that I've got it close, close at hand in the archive. What, what are you, uh, what are you working on there? Well, there'll be a paperback version of that book out um, okay. in March. So again, um, we'll, we'll have to talk about it at the time, but there's an additional bit of work on what's happened since that work was completed. So, okay. so uh, and it'll a be lot, a much more aff aff affordable price. Yes. So yes, it won't be horrendously dear, but uh, yeah, working on that and a few other things related to that too. So, more to come in 2024. Brilliant. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Thanks, John.